What's up, guys? I'm Steven, and welcome back to another episode. Yep, I'm Kylie, and we love seeing your comments and questions on our videos over the past few months since we started this channel. And we do our best to jump into the comment section and try and answer them if they're quick. There have been a few questions that would require a bit longer of a response, so we decided to gather all of those questions together and create a little Q&A video for you. Yep, so let's dive right into it. And this first one is from Gamma Ray Burst. Your videos and content are excellent. Would it be possible for both of you to start using clip-on mics in future videos? It would improve the audio quality. Yes. <laughs> well, Gamma Ray Burst, we are in agreement with you. And actually, a couple weeks ago, we bought new mics and they just arrived. So we're trying them out in this video. Hopefully they sound good. Let us know in the comments if you still have any audio problems. Or let us know if they sound better. Uh, hopefully they sound better. <laughs> Don't tear us down. Okay, so next question. We actually got a couple of similar questions to this one, but how often do you visit your property? So 99% of the time, either us or someone from our team visits the property after every cleaning, but before the next guest arrives. And this is what we call our perfection inspection. Yeah, so that's for properties that you manage locally. Since this question was left on our remote management video, I'm assuming he means how often do you visit the properties that you manage remotely? So that depends on a couple of factors, location and distance from our house being the main ones. Our property, Saguaro, which is in Scottsdale, Arizona, we get to probably three or four times a year, usually four. Then our San Diego properties, it's usually in the three to four week neighborhood where we visit those. The property up in Idaho, that's a bit of a unique situation that's owned by Kylie's parents. So they end up visiting there more than we do, but they're also in the real estate business and we work together with them. So they know what they're doing when they visit. Yeah, we work together with my dad on a lot of the properties that we manage here in the Coachella Valley. So he's a pro, my mom's well-versed in short-term rentals as well. So they got it covered up there. And we mostly handle guest messaging and pricing and things like that for that specific property. Okay, the next question is from Devin and this is from our insurance video and he said, pound sand. Steven, were you a grunt in a past life? That's funny. No, I wasn't. But thank you to all the members of the military who serve our country. Many people think we might be in the military when we were from San Diego and then transitioned to Munich and back. But I actually have an engineering degree and most of my career was spent developing electric vehicle technology. That's actually why we moved in Munich. The company I was working for in San Diego opened up an office in Munich and we spent a few years there developing wireless charging technology for electric vehicles. Okay, next question is from Tracy on our smart home video. She said, I'm loving your channel. Thank you. I have most of these smart devices, but most just different brands. That's totally fine, whatever works for you. Except I need the smart pool device. How hard was that to install and did you install it yourself? You answer that one since you are the equipment expert. I assume what she means in this question is the ability to remotely monitor and control your pool equipment. The general answer there is it depends. It depends if you have an automated pool controller. Some pools don't and they might just have like a rotary timer that controls the pump when it turns on and off per day and then it's a bit of a bigger job to add a pool controller and then the remote monitoring capability. If you already have a pool controller that's modern then the remote monitoring capability is usually a pretty straightforward add-on, but it is dealing with electricity and power and you've got to know what you're doing. It could be if you're experienced with pool equipment, you could handle it, but most likely it's better suited for your pool service person or maybe they can recommend you to someone who actually does equipment installs and they could do that for you. Great, so next question is from Fritz and this was on our insurance video and he asked, what is the typical range of monthly cost if your home is 4,000 square feet with $800,000 of dwelling coverage and $1 million in liability coverage. I mean, that would probably depend on a lot of factors, right? Yeah. It's a good question. Good question. Location's probably the biggest one, but we could call our friend Mike, who is the expert in short-term rental insurance, and see what he has to say. See if he picks up. Hello, it's Mike. Hi, Mike. It's uh, Stephen and Kylie. We're actually... Sorry to put you on the spot right now, but we're filming a YouTube video and was curious if you could give us an answer to an insurance question from one of our viewers. Yeah, nice. Yeah, thanks for calling. Sure. Happy birthday, by the way. Oh, yeah. I saw that on Facebook. Forgot it's your birthday. Happy birthday, man. Ah, so sweet. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I'm on a Monday and I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> well, good that you can answer our question then. So question is from a viewer, Fritz, and he says, what is the typical range of monthly cost if your home is 4,000 square feet with $800,000 of dwelling coverage 
and one million dollars in liability coverage. Yes, great question. And yes, the dwelling factor, the 800,000 square footage does matter. Great to see that they're quoting a million liability because that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to insurance rates, it definitely depends on where your home is located. And, you know, there's many factors that go into it. Just turning on the news this morning, you know, we see fires in California, floods in Kentucky. You know, those are extreme incidents in both ways. But, you know, these insurance companies really look at neighborhoods and loss history and factors like those. So um, I couldn't nail down a price for that question right now. A lot of factors go into it and location very important when it comes to your insurance rates. Yeah, we didn't figure you'd be able to give him a quote like without knowing where his house was, but we were curious to hear, you know, some of those factors that went into it. So that's that's great info. Thanks, Mike. I hope it helps, yeah. For sure it does. We'll um for Fritz, we'll put Mike's contact info in the video description and feel free to reach out to him directly and anyone else. And Mike's happy to give quotes on the specifics of your property. Yeah, nice. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Have, Have a great rest day. of your day. See ya. Yeah, and if you guys have any other insurance-related questions, drop them in the comments below, and maybe we could do some sort of Q&A insurance video with Mike. Okay, so the next question is from Saman on our video about dealing with neighbors. He says, hello, I love your video. I've recently got a cottage and looking for some advice on how to do Airbnb, even though the neighborhood doesn't allow. Yeah, that's a tough one. Hopefully you knew the rules going into it and that this wasn't a surprise to you after you closed escrow. But the first thing that comes to my mind, I guess, would be midterm rentals. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. I think we have eight midterm rentals in our portfolio and these are fully furnished houses where we rent them for usually 30 plus nights or longer. That's usually a milestone where city regulations or HOA regulations allow for rentals the 30 days or longer something to look into on average these properties do well but the returns are usually in the neighborhood of like 40 percent less than an equivalent property in the same market that has a short-term rental permit you'll have to do some research on your specific neighborhood if you have an hoa what their laws are and also your city regulations, you can usually look online or call your city office. The topic of midterm rentals probably deserves its own video, but usually what we found is cities are pretty keen on finding unpermitted rentals in their area and HOAs are as well. And they'll clamp down on you with pretty strict fines or other, other problems. Uh, so probably just follow the rules it would be our advice. And to look and see if midterm rentals are an option. Okay, next up is a comment from our video on our favorite apps and websites. And it says, I would be interested in a video on how to set up a blog as well as the QR code using Canva. Yeah, we'd love to do a video on blogging. We'll add that to our list. And then I'll let the local Canva expert here <laughs> talk about the QR code process. Yeah, I can do that one pretty quickly now. Will you pull up, um, will you pull up Canva? Yeah. So if you aren't familiar with Canva, this is a web and app based program. It's basically like a graphic design tool for people who aren't graphic designers. It's super simple to use, really easy user interface. I use this program a lot for client projects and design proposals. It's a good way to create a customizable kind of fancy house manual. I also use the stock images for blog posts. I use it to make our YouTube thumbnails. We use it for so many things. But getting back to the question, yes, you can use Canva also to generate QR codes. So we put the QR codes in our house manual to help drive traffic to our website and our social media channels. If you open Canva, click on create a design if you're starting from scratch or you can open up an existing project. And then over here on the left, we're going to go to elements. And then you just need to type in QR code and then click on this use app. And then you're just gonna enter in the URL that you want the QR code to direct to. So let's just try our website, arrivals.com, generate QR code. Bam, done, super easy. The next one is, can you go into more depth about how you do STR bedding? I try to avoid duvet covers as well. All right, so we like a layered system. We start with a memory foam mattress, and this is usually like a bed in a box style memory foam mattress that are nice and comfortable. We add a zippered mattress encasement because bed bugs, they're also removable, washable, in case there are any stains. And then sheets. This is definitely a hot topic in the STR world. Everybody has their opinion. Everyone thinks that their way is the best way. We use the controversial microfiber sheets. And what I can tell you is that we posted over 2,000 guests and we received so many compliments and so many questions on where we bought them, 
how can we get these for our own house? So we base our decision off of our experience. I was actually super skeptical about these sheets myself when Steven first found them. This was when we first started our very first property. I was skeptical because they were so cheap. I figured they either wouldn't last or they wouldn't be comfortable or scratchy or something. And so we just bought one set and we gave them a try ourselves. And we ended up not ever using our like expensive sheets because we like these ones better. And they're like $30. And this was four and a half years ago, and we're still using the same brand at most all of the properties that we manage. The biggest drawback we've seen to microfiber is that they attract hairs, can be a little staticky when you first wash them. Our cleaners and then our perfection inspections, it's one of the things we're looking for. If we need to take a lint roller, you know, to the sheets, uh, if we see anything, we'll do that. Then we add a white quilt. There are a lot of different brands that you can find on Amazon or Wayfair or other places. Some are softer than others, so we have a couple favorites. But in general, they hold up really well after a lot of washes and the stains come out relatively easily. And most importantly, they dry quickly, which is what is a big pain in the butt when you have a comforter, is they take forever to dry. Since these quilts are thin, we provide a layering blanket and we found this brand that we really like. It feels plush, it's quick and easy, to launder magically it dries so much faster than a lot of blankets we'll put a link to our full sample inventory in the video description it has tried and trusted products that you'll use for a vacation rental that we use ourselves and you can also just go to arrivals.com inventory and then this question mentioned duvets in almost all properties that we own and or manage we tend to avoid duvet covers as well there are a couple properties where we do use duvets and that's either because the owner specifically requested it or it's because it's in a market that gets very cold in the winter like Redford Hideaway up in Idaho and we feel like guests might want that kind of cozy up feeling. Some of our cleaners will flat out refuse to work on properties with duvet covers and some are okay with it. At Red for Hideaway, we use the brand Fix Linens. We really like their duvet covers because they have this triple zip easy on and off system that makes taking them on and off at every clean a lot faster because it really is important like do not not do not not wash your duvet covers between every guest. For fixed linens, we'll leave a link and a discount code in the video description below as well. You guys also had some topics that are gonna require their own dedicated videos, and we're going to do that. These are things like our process for setting up a home and how we scaled our business. So stay tuned for future videos. Yeah, keep the comments and the questions coming, guys, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.